We continue our discussion on protein ligand interactions. In this lecture, we will be looking at the kinetics and the thermodynamics of the protein ligand binding process. For this particular lecture, we will be looking at binding of ligands to a macromolecule, the protein ligand binding kinetics, the thermodynamics of the protein ligand interactions, and specific binding models. We had looked at some of these in the previous lecture where we saw the specifics of binding and how this occurs and specific examples of the specificity and the affinity. In this lecture, we will be looking at concepts like the dissociation constant and the scatter plot, which is a common plot in protein ligand binding. The biological systems that we consider can be described as having constant pressure and constant temperature. The system is actually free to exchange heat with the surroundings to remain at a constant temperature and it can expand or contract to achieve this constant temperature. If we look at the bindings of the ligands to the macromolecules, there is simple equilibrium binding where we look at a stoichiometric titration and other concepts of equilibrium binding and dissociation constants. In addition to this, there is complex binding where we may have a larger number of binding sites of a particular ligand to the macromolecule. Looking at biological relevant macromolecules such as proteins, they are involved as we looked at in the previous lecture in many interactions with other molecules. These molecules could include proteins, nucleic acids, membranes, small molecule ligands, and even the solvent molecules. So we have our protein of interest, and to this we have our ligand molecule. The enzyme substrate example is a unique example of this substrate forming an enzyme substrate complex, which is a subset of our protein ligand binding. If we look at the protein and we understand that this ligand is now bound in the active site, by the law of mass action, we can say that we have in the particular stoichiometry where we consider a one is to one stoichiometry, we have the protein and the ligand interact to form the protein ligand complex. We have to remember that this is an equilibrium situation where we may have the ligand also be unbound from the protein ligand complex. So this would result in an association and the reverse process would be a dissociation. When we look at the association constant, the Ka value, we have the protein ligand concentration as the numerator and the protein concentration and the ligand concentration, the product of those concentrations as the denominator. When we consider the dissociation constant, since it, it is the reverse of this reaction, we realize that this is going to be the inverse of the association constant. This is important in an understanding of how strong the complex is. For example, if we want an enzyme substrate complex to form, we would not want the binding to be too tight because the, then the substrate would not be released from the ligand or the product bound to the active site would not be released. However, when we are designing an inhibitor, in that case, we would want this complex to be really tight, having a very high affinity and having a very tight association. So when we are looking at the concentration of the protein ligand, we see that this is a product of the association constant, the protein and the ligand concentrations. Now, the intermolecular association can actually be described by two rate constants. 
So if we look at the forward reaction, we have a rate constant that is called K on. We have the reverse, that is the K off, saying that the ligand is on or off the active site. This is also referred to, we can call this the K1 and the K minus 1, these being small k's indicating rates. Now, if we look at the forward reaction then, the rate of the forward reaction would be the rate constant multiplied by the product of the concentrations and the reverse would be the k of multiplied by its PL concentration because we are going in the reverse direction. If we look at the units of the forward and the reverse reactions, we realize that these are given by concentrations into second inverse and these are the concentration of K on are mole inverse, second inverse, units of K off are second inverse. So now that we have our equilibrium situation described by actually two rate constants, so we have to reach an equilibrium where the forward rate and the reverse rate are the same. To do that, we have to have an equality in terms of the forward and the reverse rate given by these expressions here. And we then have an equilibrium concentration of the protein ligand complex, the protein and the ligand. This equilibrium concentration gives us our association constant, the inverse of it, the dissociation constant, which is the ratio of the K on and the K off. The ratio of the K on to the K off is therefore equal to the equilibrium constant for the association reaction. So we have to remember that when we are determining the thermodynamics of a protein ligand binding system, we have to look or we have to determine the association constant. We have to ensure that the reaction has reached an equilibrium. So now that we have an understanding of what the association constant is, the reverse of the inverse of the dissociation constant, it is a ratio of the K on K off values. For tight binding, we realize that we would want the K A value to be very high. That is, this would be much, much greater than 1, which would indicate that we would want a KD value to be very low. So a low KD value is indicative of tight binding. This means that we would need to have a large, if K on is very large, then K off must be very small. This can be shown mathematically that the rate at which the two simple objects associate would depend upon their radius and their effective molecular weight and even the orientation in which the molecules come together to form the protein ligand complex. So now if we assume that the rate at which P and L associate is diffusion limited, what do we mean by this? We mean that when we consider a diffusion limited or a diffusion control reaction, these are, these are the reactions where the reaction rate is equal to the rate of the transport of the reactants through the reaction medium because there is a limit by which we can have the motion of the molecules. The theoretical value for K on is around 10 to the 8 mole inverse second inverse. So if KD is known, we can determine what K off is because we know that the association constant Ka being the inverse of KD is equal to K on by K off. Now, the possible conditions that we can look at is we can, because we are designing the experiment, we can adjust the concentrations of the protein and the ligand. The zero subscript in each case means the initial concentrations that we have started off with. In the conditions of ligand in excess, we can assume that the total protein that has been taken 
is bound by the ligand because we have taken the ligand in excess. We can measure the biological activity of PL, that is the complex, the rate of disappearance or dissociation of the PL and K of can be obtained. This is dependent on what we can observe. For a first order rate constant, we know that the half-life of the reaction can also be calculated. As one who is going to design an experiment, we start off with specific concentrations of protein and ligand. We allow the situation to reach an equilibrium, which means that the concentration of PL will increase. We saw such an example in the previous lecture, which we will revisit in our experimental observations of protein ligand binding. So when we look at macromolecular ligand binding, we can describe a quantity mu that represents the moles of bound ligand per mole of bound protein. So we have the protein ligand concentration divided by the total protein that was present. This means that we have an amount of free protein and the rest of the protein is bound with the ligand. So this would be the moles of bound ligand, and this would be the amount of protein that we have, which would either be in the bound form or in the unbound form. So the unbound form, as I just mentioned here, the P and the L correspond to the unbound protein and ligand. And PL, P total and L total represent the total amount of protein and ligand that we have in the system. What we can do is from the previous expression that we just looked at, we can rearrange this to work it to form new being given this expression. Where L is the concentration of the unbound ligand, which is not the same as L total, and certain binding experiments, as we just looked at, measure the concentration of the bound ligand. And from that, we can actually calculate the free ligand. It may also be such that depending upon how we have designed the experiment, if our total ligand concentration is very high, then we can assume that the free ligand is approximately equal to the total ligand. We will look at these expressions for the amount of bound ligand per macromolecule in the subsequent slides. So we are looking at mu that is equal to the protein ligand concentration of the complex divided by the P total, which we found was the unbound protein and the bound protein. So if we look at this expression, we found out from one of the expressions earlier with a knowledge of what we mean by Ka, we can find out the value or we can express our new value in terms of just the free ligand concentration. Now in many experimental procedures, new can be measured at a range of ligand concentrations from which we can find out the value of the dissociation constant followed by the free energy of binding. If we look at some specific KD values for biological systems, I have some examples here where we are looking at monovalent ions binding to proteins or DNA. They are in the millimolar range. When we look at activators of enzymes, allosteric activators, some examples which we looked at in the previous lecture, they range from micromolar to millimolar range. When we have site-specific binding to DNA, they go even better as nanomolar to picomolar. Trypsin inhibitor binding to the protease is also in the picomolar range. And we can have antibody antigen interaction that can go to a very high specificity, very high affinity with very low values for the dissociation constants, meaning that these interactions are very tight. If we look at our value now of the dissociation constant, 
we can look at a delta G, the free energy of winding. Now, we know from our expression of delta G that delta G is equal to delta H minus T delta S. This implies that we have enthalpic and entropic components in our delta G of binding. Molecular recognition associated is associated with changes in structure and dynamics of both the protein and the ligand. So we have to realize that there are associations in terms of the electrostatics, the hydrogen bonding, the hydrophobic interactions, Van der Waals interactions that will contribute to the enthalpy of this overall process. Again, we are looking at an association. So there will be an entropic contribution, not only from the association of the two molecules coming together, but also the removal of the water molecules from the surrounding or from the environment of the active site of the macromolecule and from the surface of the ligand, which would all contribute to the enthalpic and the entropic contributions that would give us an idea of what delta G is. But we know that for the spontaneous binding, we would need to have a delta G that is negative. The interactions of macromolecules and ligands involve a very high degree of specificity and affinity which means, as we just mentioned, an understanding of the forces so that we can get a correct description of the thermodynamics of binding. And based on this, we can actually correlate the thermodynamic parameters with the structures of the macromolecules and the ligands in trying to understand what are the components present in the active site of the protein or what are the specific moieties the chemical description of the ligand that is going to result in a good interaction, a favorable interaction for the macromolecular ligand binding. If we look at the interactions or get a further understanding of what the dissociation constant actually means, we can look now at the new versus the L. Now, when we saw the specific expression for nu versus L, we saw that we can look at a ligand concentration and we have a KD value here. Now, if we look at the KD, this actually gives us the concentration of the ligand that saturates 50% of the sites. We have to realize that we get this saturation because the macromolecule has a limited number of binding sites. So there is a saturation that will be observed in any of these protein ligand, protein ligand experiments as well as enzyme substrate experiments because there is a specific concentration of protein in this case or enzyme when we look at enzyme uh, lectures, we have a definite concentration of the protein and the enzyme. So there are a limited number of active sites to which the ligand can bind. So when we look at this specific interaction, we look at a KD value that corresponds to the concentration of the protein ligand divided by the PL that all can also give us the value of the association constant. Now, Almost all the binding sites are saturated usually if the ligand concentration is 10 times the KD value. So we want to look at a value of 0.5 here that corresponds to our KD value. And from the KD value, as we looked at previously, we can determine the free energy of binding. So we have our new value. We have our expression. Now, in many experimental procedures, we can measure new for a, a series of ligand concentrations as we looked at. And from that, we can determine either the Ka value or the Kd value as we saw from a specific plot of the new versus L. Now, when we look at the new versus L plot, it is difficult to 
sort of understand the actual number of binding sites or a KD value. So the best thing would be to linearize the plot, which we will see. But if we want to go for a larger range of concentration along the x-axis that we are looking here, we go for a logarithmic scale. And the advantage of using this is we get the data that is spread out at a lower ligand concentration, forming this characteristic S-curve. And the best results are obtained if we can get binding data over several orders of magnitude. Because if we look at the initial states here, we will see we have many values for the mu for a small span of ligand concentration. So if we use a logarithmic scale, we can actually spread this out into an S-shaped curve. We have a look now at scattered plots where the binding data can be linearized to give the scattered plot that is given by a specific equation, which we will visit. So we start with the equation nu, the definition of which we know is the PL concentration divided by the total P, the total macromolecule. If we multiply both sides of this equation, we get this particular set. Now, if we do a bit of algebra where we have nu plus nu KAL giving us KAL, KA being our association constant. When we rearrange this equation, we have the following form of the equation. Now we see that if we can plot nu L versus nu, we can get a value for the KA as the slope of the plot and the y-intercept. So this gives us a value of the association constant. It may so happen that we have multiple binding sites on the protein, where we are looking at specific and active site specific here, or we can have a different binding site here, where we could have a ligand molecule here. We could also have a ligand molecule at this position here, which means that we have to account for possibilities of identical binding sites, independent binding sites, and so on and so forth. It could so happen that the binding sites are not identical, or they are dependent upon each other, or they, there is cooperative binding, which we will see later. If we have multiple identical binding sites, then we would have a number of ligands that would actually associate with the protein. So in this case, the scattered equation would be nu by L versus equal to N K A minus nu K A. So again, when we plot nu versus Y L versus nu, we should get a straight line. And from the slope of the intercept, we get this. And the Y intercept gives us N K A, which is useful in determining binding sites in proteins. So for n sites on the macromolecule, let us see how we can actually calculate the value for the nu. We need the concentration of the bound ligand, that is the numerator, and we need the concentration of the total protein, that is the denominator. So we know that when we are looking at the concentration of bound protein, we could have one molecule of pro ligand, we could have two, we could have three, and so on and so forth. So we have an expression like this summing over all the possible interactions. When we look at the concentration of the macromolecule, we have it in this form or in this form with one ligand bound or with two ligands bound or with three and so on and so forth. So the, the summation of the amount of macromolecule would be this. So the moles of bound ligand per protein would be this as the numerator and this as the denominator, accounting for the n sites of macromolecule where we have the moles of bound ligand per mole of bound protein. So for multiple sites, we have P plus L giving us PL. We could have PL taking up another ligand giving us PL2. And then PL2 plus L giving us PL3. In this expression, therefore, 
when we know that we can rewrite the PL concentration in terms of a product of the K values with the concentrations of the protein and the ligand, this rearranges to form or to get a new value that has the specific equilibrium constants of each equilibrium and the ligand concentrations. So we can get an idea of how to determine the values for the equilibrium constants. This is given by the Adair equation. Another plot that is very commonly used is called the Benesi Hildebrand plot, where again our definition for nu is the protein ligand concentration, the complex, and the total protein. Here we have n by L equal to nKa mu Ka, giving us a number of binding sites n. When we rearrange this equation, do a bit of algebra, we can rearrange this to give us 1 by nu with 1 by L that we can plot to give us the value of N and the value of KD. So this is an equation of the form of Y is equal to MX plus C. And from this equation, we can extract N and KD from the binding data. We will look at specific examples in our discussion class where we will solve for some specific problems where we will determine the values of N and KD. So when we look at a simple binding situation where we have the bound ligand versus the, and the free ligand versus the bound ligand, so the LB at the bound ligand and the free ligand, we have a simple binding given by our scattered equation. When we look at two different sites and we see that we have a binding characteristic curve like this, this accounts for non-specific binding given by negative cooperativity. If we look at positive cooperativity or an unstable ligand, we would get a plot like this. So a simple binding plot would give us a distinct straight line. We can have variations in terms of negative cooperativity and positive cooperativity. So I look at our scattered plot where we have the ratio of the bound to the unbound ligand, the bound ligand PL concentration here. We can see what this looks like where we have a straight line that corresponds to no cooperativity, negative cooperativity if we have a line that corresponds or a curve that appears like this when we plot this particular data. Or we could have data like this, which would indicate that there is positive cooperativity in our system. And there would be different methods to deal with the positive cooperativity. So we looked at the bindings of ligands to the macromolecule, protein ligand binding kinetics, the thermodynamics of protein ligand interactions, and specific types of models where we will revisit this later on when we look at cooperativity and see how our model changes as to how our plots will change to understand the effect of cooperativity. These are the references. Thank you.